So this is uh, this presentation is the second part of a two-part series entitled "Dispelling Myths in Early Childhood Oral Health," and I'd like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Robert Schrote and Melina Sturm. Dr. Schrote is the co-lead for Healthy Smile, Happy Child, and a professor and clinician scientist in the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. He currently holds a Canadian Institute of Health Research Embedded Clinician Researcher position with a salary award for improving access to oral health care and oral health care delivery for at-risk young children in Manitoba. His research focuses on early childhood oral health and the epidemiology of early childhood caries in at-risk populations. And welcome to Melina Sturm. Melina graduated from the University of Manitoba in the School of Dental Hygiene in 2017. And she's currently a research assistant and oral health promoter with Healthy Smile, Happy Child. And she also does some clinical work at Mount Carmel Clinic here in Winnipeg. And if our speakers are ready, we are ready to begin. Okay. So thanks very much. And um, to those of you joining us today, I know many um, are heading back into clinical practice soon or have already started to do so, but we do thank you for giving up your lunch hour today. And so our first question is, what I eat, so as a pregnant woman, what I eat during pregnancy will have no effect on my baby's oral health. Um, and Melina will put that up there. That is a myth. And I know frequently we do get asked that question when we've, uh, we're giving presentations and working with uh, prenatal groups of expectant moms. Um, so just to highlight and emphasize again that we like to think that caring for baby teeth begins well before baby arrives. So making sure that mom is on a good nutritional uh, dietary uh, regimen. Um, and often what people fail to think about is that primary teeth actually begin to develop about six weeks of pregnancy. And therefore, we need to make sure that um, during that even first trimester, that there is a good source of vitamin and calcium, uh, vitamin D and calcium that are essential not only for building of healthy bones, but also for strong teeth. So we have done some research before looking at this connection of prenatal vitamin D and does it increase the risk for kids um, having early childhood caries. So this is a group of children that were followed in Winnipeg. Moms were recruited during pregnancy and then followed until the child was um, just past the first birthday. And here, if you're wondering what this looks, uh, what this graph is, it's really the decayed tooth score. So the number of decayed primary teeth are up on the y-axis and the x-axis across going horizontally is the um, vitamin D level that moms had during pregnancy. And we did find an inverse relationship. So the moms who had better vitamin D, so at the 140, 150 range, um, their children had far fewer teeth affected by decay than moms who had very low vitamin D levels. So this is just graphing it. So think about it, the better vitamin D status mom has, better nutritionally that they are during pregnancy, um, there is this association for um, lower risk for tooth decay. And we think a lot of it might have to do with how the enamel itself forms. Next slide, Melina. Thanks. Here's uh, just from the same study again, um, just looking at um, whether or not in the end children had caries or not. And we looked at a whole host of factors, including socioeconomics, such as um, low income, uh, the child, child's health status, uh, milk intake, um, whether or not um, there was employment in the household or government assistance. And the variables that really stood out in the end of being most associated with kids having caries during infancy, so I'll remind you that this is sort of just after the first birthday, where the green arrows are. So enamel hypoplasia, definitely sort of an underappreciated risk factor for early childhood caries, but we know more and more that these enamel defects are really areas where bacteria can colonize. And because the enamel is either thinner or missing altogether in these areas, the caries process is much more rapid um, and can then extend quickly into dentin. Uh, also, the infant age at time of the dental examination. So we found even within a spectrum of a few months, 
kids who were a little bit older than other children, so even a few months older, each month that they were older increased their risk for having uh, caries. Um, so we know we definitely want, um, as children age and more teeth are erupting into the mouth, that there is a good oral hygiene regimen, uh, including brushing with a toothpaste uh, in place. And then as well, as I mentioned, the vitamin D level in that other graph, but here controlling for all of these other variables, also ma maternal vitamin D status also revealed that lower levels of vitamin D were associated with an increased risk for early childhood caries. Thanks, Melina. And just to let you know that it's not always necessarily caries, that's the manifestation of poor maternal prenatal nutrition. Um, on the left of the screen, we see here that these are photos of primary teeth of, of children with developmental defects of enamel. They look like caries, but when you probe them and look at them closer clinically, there is no uh, soft um, dentin. These are developmental in uh, basically indications that there was disruption to the child's nutrition. And most of these photos that I have for developmental defects are really from many of our newcomer and refugee children who have often been born in refugee camps where we know that the nutrition is not great. And then here are just some other photos of children with caries. Um, just so that you can know it can be even the early white spots, but then the more advanced caries lesions. Next slide. Hi everyone. Um, so our next slide is um, receiving dental care during pregnancy is safe. Um, this is a question that we often get. Um, so that's a fact, it's true. So a lot of women um, are usually afraid to go to the dental office while pregnant because they think it's not safe but it's actually recommended that um, they do go to the dental office because um, often morning sickness and hormonal changes can make women more prone to gum disease and uh, caries. So it's important uh, that they go to the dental office for preventive care, diagnostic and restorative uh, dental treatment um, throughout their pregnancy in order to improve and maintain their oral health. So um, yeah, healthy pregnant um, women should not be afraid to go to the dentist and dental providers uh, should not deny women who, um, who are healthy, they're having a healthy pregnancy of any care just because they're pregnant. Um, it's always important though, just to make sure to take a thorough medical history prior to the appointment, asking um, the women if, you know, when they're due, if they have any medical conditions, they're taking any medications if their pregnancy has, deemed, uh, has been deemed to be uh, high risk. That's important as well. And um, consultation with the patient's doctor is usually not required unless they have been identified as being at risk for any pregnancy complications. Um, we had a question last time about dental hygiene treatment while uh, pregnant. And dental hygiene treatment, um, so can be done at any time during the pregnancy. Um, we dental hygienists also um, are supposed to be asking uh, a med, taking a medical history, so same as a dentist. And um, it's just good to um, for um, pregnant women to come and do the the cleaning, the dental cleaning, the hygiene appointments, just to maintain a good oral health throughout. Um, for routine dentistry, we usually recommend that pregnant women come to the dentist usually during the second trimester if, if possible. And they usually, all the treatments should be directed towards controlling disease and maintaining good oral health, as I said, in order to prevent any problems or complications during the pregnancy. For extensive dental care um, and electric treatment, um, we do recommend that it should be postponed until after the delivery if it's um, extensive treatment that's required and it's not needed. And this is just a resource, a resource that we have here that we created um, with information about pregnancy, gut infection and pregnancy and dental care, uh, also about uh, pregnancy and uh, prenatal nutrition as well. And here we have, uh, these are some really good resources from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, they have a toolkit with um, a lot of resources about prenatal care and oral health and pregnancy. So we thought it'd be nice um, to show you this. Okay. Um. 
Yeah, Melina, I really like that the toothbrush image with the pregnancy test stick. I think it's yeah. really neat and gets people sort of thinking. Like on the top, you see the toothbrush and you look at the orange section and you see that. So it, it's sometimes good visual yeah. can capture attention. Yeah, it's clever. Yeah. Excellent. So I'll, I'll admit the next question that we often get posed, um, you know, sometimes stumps me on how to answer this. So it's uh, common for children to grind their teeth, especially when teething. Um, so um, it's a fact. Um, and even I think in general, bruxism, we'll talk a little bit about brux bruxism because quite often I do have parents who come and when they're bringing in their three, four-year-old, five-year-old, and the parents will mention to me that they hear their child grinding in their sleep and we're trying to always see what the causes are. Um, so bruxism, think of that, that's our, that's our technical definition for grinding the teeth and clenching, clenching of the jaws. And it, it can be actually relatively common in children to do this. Uh, many times the kids will outgrow this um, and once the primary teeth are through. Um, a lot of times this is done at nighttime, which sort of corresponds to what parents are often telling me and maybe that's what they've been telling you in your clinical practice. Um, and so um, really, according to the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, there's multiple risk factors or things that might be causing this, um, including emotional stress. So maybe the child is under the stress at home. Um, parasomnia, so maybe during sleep, there's some neurological disruption that's going on that also maybe leads children to be grinding. Um, perhaps it is a response to some sort of pain as well. Um, so I think what parents often first let us know is about this audible or the grinding noises while sleeping. That's sort of, they say it just, it's a horrible sound on teeth on teeth sort of grinding. Um, but also there's some morphological reasons why kids might be grinding or bruxing their teeth and that could be malocclusion. Um, that may be some alignment issues as we've got on the screen here or as well it could be some sort of muscle recruitment and muscle sort of issues. So um, if you do have these um, questions coming from parents you can let them know that yes it, it's being experienced and then maybe you can query a little bit as to sort of whether or not the child's under some sort of stress right now uh, and try to, to problem solve with the parent. Next slide Melina. So um, Many times the bruxism has no direct effect, but often we'll see uh, some young children who will really have large patterns of attrition on their teeth, a lot of wearing down um, to the point that sometimes primary teeth look like little stubs that are left. Um, so it's just to be aware of that and maybe bring these children in and, and follow them a little bit more frequently um, and see then as well if parents can maybe get into the habit of maybe a relaxing bedtime routine for kids. Maybe again, there's maybe too much stimulation going on, maybe reading books, a warm bath, you know, just cuddle time before bed uh, is really a good thing and helps kids get uh, asleep in a more relaxed um, fashion. Next slide. Um, we've also last, uh, last session, we got asked the question by Dr. Taylor about uh, the effects or the potential effects that fluoride might have on uh, teeth as, as they start to develop before they erupt into the mouth. So a pre-eruptive fluoride beneficial effect. Um, so, um, and that is a fact that um, there can be an effect of fluoride systemically as we know into erupting teeth and also prenatally. So think about again, these teeth beginning to develop and calcify in that six to eight week of pregnancy. So uh, really in that first trimester we know that there can be some fluoride exchange from mothers to fetus through the placenta, and that can get incorporated into the inner enamel. Um, many of the references from this are from the 1980s. There hasn't been a lot of research since on that that we were able to find. Um, and then the surface enamel uh, fluoride levels of primary teeth increase with increasing pre and post uh, postnatal fluoride administration. So some in some countries in the US, there's still um, fluoride supplements that are often prescribed. We don't do that as much in Canada, um, just as uh, this, just not our, our um, favored route of doing that, of, of administering fluoride. Um, and then recognize that 
too little intake of fluoride or too high fluoride in intake can also affect how the enamel develops and could lead to some enamel defects in primary teeth. Next slide. Um, so the pre-eruptive effects of fluoride. So fluoride ingested prior to tooth eruption is partly incorporated into that tooth enamel. So just think if your child, if you're constituting formula with a tap water that's fluoridated, your infant is receiving that as well. Um, in any, if you put water, tap water in, in a sippy cup as well or a bottle, kids are getting fluoride, uh, getting fluoride that way as well. And so it depends on how much is being ingested of, of fluoridated beverages uh, and foods. Um, so I think the benefit though, if there is this pre-eruptive ingestion, so if some kids do receive uh, fluoride before teeth erupt, it helps uh, the enamel to become a little bit more acid resistant um, and prevents it from uh, dissolving later on um, in acid too quickly. Um, and then the post-eruptive um, use of fluoride has definitely been shown to have a, a big benefit on caries inhibition. And just remember from our last talk, newly erupted primary teeth are actually more susceptible than teeth that have been in the mouth for longer periods of time because um, we want the fluoride exposure. So that's why sort of good dental care early on with the first tooth and even the use of fluorides um, in, a, in a controlled amount is beneficial. Again, um, questions about some parents not necessarily recognizing how big of a concern early childhood caries is. Um, and we know it is a myth. Um, and more and more I'm seeing on a weekly basis, especially even with our new um, immigrant populations and refugee populations, more and more the change in diet, change in lifestyle practices, um, and kids now coming with extreme decay and, you know, yesterday, you know, almost doing this now monthly, um, extracting for upper incisors of, of preschoolers um, because the teeth are not restorable and, and pretty broken down. We know that it's prevalent in Manitoba, um, high in, in northern populations, um, but where there's limited access to care, but generally speaking, anywhere between roughly four out of 10 kids may be experiencing early childhood caries. And again, there's a spectrum. It could be kids having just one tooth affected and others could have multiple teeth affected by decay. But again, kids under six years of age, this does put a big burden on our society. The colors, I'm seeing a question, what was the colors? The blues were just first time studies, the green represented of follow-up examinations where sometimes there is no drastic change in the prevalence of early childhood caries, but some of our activities have found fewer kids having the severe type that often needs to be treated uh, under GA. Um, Melina is going to put up our next slide here. So um, it's so common in Canada, think about it, without data from Quebec, there's 19,000 surgeries um, for treatment of caries each year being done in Canadian facilities. Um, kids receiving general anesthetic. And when we think about all of the day surgeries that are done in Canada, tubes in the ears, um, tonsils, other types of day surgical procedures, um, dental caries um, accounts for almost a third of that. So it does let us know that there's more preventive work to do. And I think in the absence of having good national data on how healthy kids' teeth are, because we don't have the government funding to screen a, a, a representative sample of kids on a regular basis. Um, so looking at how many kids are these rates that kids are going for surgery under GA to have caries treated is, is I think, a good benchmark or um, a uh, metric that we need to check on a regular basis to see how we're doing. And then if we look here, um, these are rates. So if we look at the, if we were just to look at volumes, our bigger provinces with bigger populations like Ontario and BC and Alberta would have the higher numbers of kids being treated. But then when we express it at, per the, the population of kids in that age range, and have that as per every 1,000 children. The Canadian average is about 12 out of every 1,000 kids will have a general anesthetic under five years of age each year. In Manitoba, we're about fifth from the, the worst. Um, so it's not 
good position to be in. About 25 um, kids per thousand are having surgery. But if we go to communities that have um, low access to care, especially in northern um, areas, our, our rates are almost as high as Nunavut of over 100 um, kids per 1,000. So think about that as, you know, uh, 100 or 106 uh, per thousand really represents um, one in 10 almost kids, right? So uh, we do have this problem in Canada. And then the cost. So this is just an example of cost from a study that we did in uh, 2016 with the Canadian Institutes of Health Information. Uh, they collect all of this data from hospital visits. This is just looking at the hospital cost, not the dental cost, but the nursing time, anesthesia time, and over $21 million annually is spent just on treating it in the hospital. And then you factor in the dental cost, which is probably almost a similar amount. Um, so it's, this is a good metric when you have conversations with um, people in elected offices um, that, uh, and maybe even others just to engage them in the conversation of how important it is to um, look after and prevent early childhood caries. And there can be impacts on health and well-being. So um, there's more and more literature coming out, but definitely, um, you know, the literature is not necessarily always great on many of these um, um, outcomes, but there, has, there have been links with growth and development that body mass index more and more we're finding um, that um, um, kids, at least Canadian kids, appear to be having higher body mass index scores with caries. I know early in the 1990s, people were reporting, oh, that early childhood caries, it's always a failure to thrive. They're going to be low weight, um, very scrawny kids. And we're actually finding um, the complete opposite in Canada. And, and international data is mixed. It's a bit of both. Um, there's some risks as well to nutritional status. And then we think about more and more is these quality of life um, measures. What's their eating pattern like? What is their sleeping interrupted? Um, what's their behavior like? Are they experiencing pain? So there are some tools now that we're using in our research to start documenting um, beyond the teeth. What are the effects um, of caries? I saw that, yes, um, Dr. Taylor mentioned as well, the cost, the travel costs as well for kids going to surgery is a big problem. Melina, over to you. Right, so the uh, next slide is, infant feeding practices are the main causes of early childhood caries. And this is something that most people associate with caries is like sugars and candy. Um, However, um, this is a myth. It is a big part. Infant uh, feeding practices is a big part um, of early childhood caries, but it's not the um, main cause only um, of early childhood caries development. So these are just some of the other terms that have been used in the past instead of early childhood caries to describe um, the disease. And as you can see, a lot of them have to do with infant or uh, feeding practices. A lot of them have to do with um, bottle feeding or uh, with um, sippy cups or with um, sugary drinks or milk. But um, as you can see, the Canadian Dental Association um, has put out a position statement about ECC, recognizing it to be a multifactorial um, disease. Um, we know now that it's not just a result of poor feeding practices, uh, but it's actually, it has many different risk factors that go into the development of early childhood caries. Um, and early childhood caries is heavily influenced by biomedical factors, so diet, bacteria, host, like the teeth, and then um, the social determinants of health as well. So here we have the um, Fisher-Owens model that's um, used uh, heavily when talking about early childhood caries. It shows at the center the three main things um, that are um, needed for the development of ACC. So you need uh, microflora, you need um, your diet is linked to it, and of course you need teeth, um, uh, the host. Um, then surrounding oral health, we have the individual determinants, um, like biologic and gene genetics, um, the dental care that the child is getting, um, demo demographic, um, 
attributes and health behaviors and practices. After that, we have the familial level uh, influences, so socioeconomic status, uh, physical safety, family function, culture um, are big things that affect the oral health of uh, children and the development of early childhood caries. And um, enveloping all this, we have community level influences that might also affect um, the development of early childhood caries, including um, community or a health environment, um, culture as well in a, a bigger um, level than just the family. Um, so feeding practices, as, as we said, are important, but they are not the um, only risk factor that we have. These are some of the other risk factors that contribute to the development of ECC. So the age of the child, like um, um, Bob said, primary teeth are a lot more prone to developing caries at an early age. So the earlier the child, the higher the, the sorry, the younger the child, the higher the risk of develop, uh, developing ECC. Um, low socioeconomic status is also a significant risk factor because it can affect um, access to um, dental care. Um, fluoridation um, of the water in the area where the child is living is also a big risk factor. Of course, sugar consumption and frequency of snacking hygiene, um, sorry, oral hygiene uh, routines are also uh, important. Um, enamel defects, like Bob mentioned previously, contribute to um, uh, a higher risk of developing ECC and a lot of other um, risk factors. So it's not just one thing that you have to watch out for. Um, it's many things that contribute to it. And I thought this would be a good thing to show people um, as well, just the winning of um, a child off the bottle by H1 is important um, because a lot of people we find in our research are still, um, uh, sorry, are still giving, giving the bottle to children at that time or um, propping up the bottle. So we always say the best way to lower the risk of developing ECC is just to not give the child a bottle full of sugary drinks or milk, especially if they need it at night. Um, so weaning the child off like cold turkey is not a good idea, it won't work. So we developed this research just showing how um, little by little you can start getting the child used to not having a bottle full of milk at that time. And this can help um, with lowering the risk. And then um, another question that I often get or a statement is brushing and flossing is bad for bleeding gums. Um, this is a myth. So I have a lot of um, patients at the clinic. I ask them if they're flossing, how often they're brushing. And they say, you know, they say, oh, well, I started flossing, but then my gums were bleeding, so I stopped. Um, so I always have to explain to them um, that the bleeding of the gums is caused by uh, inflammation of the gums because there's plaque on the teeth under the gums that are causing this inflammatory reaction. And the best way um, to get rid of uh, gingivitis is to have a good consistent oral um, hygiene routine, which includes flossing. So I always say, you know, that you're gonna bleed, you have to work through it. Uh, the more you floss, the less you're gonna have bleeding gums over time. It's also important for me to talk to patients about how gingivitis can progress to uh, bone loss and periodontal disease if left untreated. So that usually gives them a push to maybe start flossing again. Um, I always say, you know, gingivitis can be reversed. So um, if you have a good oral hygiene routine, brushing two times a day um, for two minutes, flossing daily, continue to floss, um, getting regular dental hygiene appointments and dental checkups is important as well. And uh, a lot of moms talk about their children having bleeding gums as well um, and not flossing. So I always say, you know, just continue to help them brushing until they're about eight years old, until they can do it themselves like thoroughly. Um, and then flossing as well if it's possible. But just helping the child brush, it's a big help because sometimes they might not be getting all the areas that have plaque. So that's really important. And I always say the better care you take of your teeth, the less inflammation and the less bleeding you'll experience over time. Okay. 
And thanks, Melina. And I know often what we recommend are these disposable floss sticks. They're so handy for parents because I think if you've got a very active child, it's hard to have the child in a headlock and then use the strand of floss. So yeah. these disposable floss sticks are wonderful. So more and more they're willing to use that. We also get asked questions from time to time, even in our community presentations and even from patients and parents is, you know, this whole discussion about composite or these resin white fillings, is there, are they better than the traditional sort of silver amalgam um, fillings that are placed? Um, and so um, we're going to say that that's a myth and talk a little bit about pros and cons of each. Um, I think part of that is the discussion that you as if you're a, if you're a dental uh, practitioner, you need to have that conversation with your patients and parents if you're dealing with with children, the pros and cons of doing each. Um, so uh, really think about restorations or these fillings as replacing where you've removed the decay. You're trying to restore with a filling and bring the tooth back to form and function again, right? So that way you don't have a leftover uh, hole in the tooth. And there's pros and cons to both. Um, so if we talk a little bit about the resin restorations, um, the white fillings, so uh, quite often we do these in situations where there's maybe very small or limited decay, especially perhaps in permanent teeth of children and adolescents, where we can do very small uh, restorations that don't need a lot of tooth to be removed. Um, and because of the bonding of the resin material, it's very beneficial. Um, another benefit is you can often very well match to the shade of the tooth, so it becomes almost an invisible type of filling. And especially think about it, um, the note here that we have better for anterior teeth is really the aesthetics, right? So you don't want to have necessarily a, a silver colored filling on your front tooth where everybody can see you talk, right? Um, the challenges are they're more costly, so that means um, patients have to pay more if they're paying out of pocket. Insurances, some um, a government or, or work insurance programs may or may not reimburse at the same amounts. Um, it's a little bit more technique sensitive. Um, I think this is the conversation that definitely you need to have, especially if there's a lot of plaque, like Melina's talking about gingivitis. If there's gingivitis around, really, you know, that's not a good condition, not ideal for placing these because you, they're more technique sensitive. And then um, their durability, um, you know, Dr. Taylor's the prosthodontist in the group, so he'll probably have some comments afterwards that he can always help me out if, if need be as our chief dental officer of Canada. Um, but we, we know that the, the, the need to replace is often a much higher, especially when we find patients are not maintaining good oral hygiene, they don't, got, they don't have those good habits. Amalgam, I think is very affordable. I think it's a much longer lasting product. Um, I still place amalgams. I also place uh, resins in my mouth. I have one amalgam and three resins. So I've got a mixture myself and depends on maybe when the teeth were restored and where, the, where my fillings are. Um, uh, and I think they just hold up better um, in the area in the mouth, especially if somebody doesn't have the best oral hygiene habits. Um, you know, of course, um, some people might have allergies to metals and sometimes parents may mention that to us. Um, there is a bit of mercury contained within the product, but again, recognize, you know, if this is parents' concerns and so we often guide people to the Canadian Dental Association resources that they have, helping you choose and realizing that there's very little mercury released um, during the chewing process. You actually have much more increase in release of, of that if you're removing, drilling out um, amalgam restorations. Um, sometimes you need a little bit more tooth removed to have bulk and um, you're often locking this type of filling in place whereas the resins are bonded to the tooth structure. Um, and then teeth might just look dark. Sometimes if you've got a big silver filling, amalgam filling, you can see through the enamel over the years and it might sort of look, the tooth might look a little bit gray. So next slide. So I think, you know, 
often, you know, I hear even with my trainees over the years, might be a med student goes through med, you know, on their parents' dental insurance. They work with us for a few summers, then they get their first residency position and their own dental benefits, and then I get they sometimes will tell me, hey, you know what? I got my first filling the other day. And my, my question back to them is, oh, you changed dentist, did you? And so I think the issue here is often, you know, if you're being followed by your dentist, they might be aware that maybe that's that um, area um, that they were maybe just monitoring that, that small cavity over time. Others, you know, will go to a new dentist and sometimes the conversation is, oh, should I replace the fillings? Yes or no. And sometimes patients will come to us and saying, oh, I think I should have these all removed. And I think we don't want patients to do that. I think replacing restorations only when they need, if they're failing um, to truly restore the area, if they're starting to break, if there's new caries developing around them, that's an indication. Um, but, and then think about uh, the factors. So um, if the filling's intact, um, I would often leave it alone. And sometimes our best treatment for even a, a tooth that requires additional fillings is even putting a filling into the filling sometimes. Um, maybe good survival. So we do want people to know that silver fillings do release very small amounts of the mercury, um, that this is not linked to illness. And thankfully our Canadian Health Measures Survey, um, that's a national survey, um, our next round will include dental. And again, past studies have looked at, I think even excretion of mercury in the urine, don't quote me on that, but I believe there have been some studies looking at that um, just to make sure that it's safe. But yes, we know many countries around the world are pushing to reduce the amount of mercury. And I think just naturally, we as a dental community have over the years, the, the amount of, of, of uh, amalgam restorations are decreasing over time, but there still is a role for them to play um, in, in adult and children's mouths. Um, here's an actually just thought we would, we would add this in. So just this last year, there's been a great study that's come out of, um, I believe Scotland is where uh, Nicola Innes is. Um, yep. Um, in the United Kingdom. And so uh, Dr. Innes um, had a team and they call it the fiction trial. So filling children's teeth indicated or not. And basically they had children randomized from community dental clinics into three different arms. They were gonna get traditional restorations where you would remove all the cavity and place a filling and get prevention. The others were recruited to a minimally invasive approach where you basically would just put a filling over some of the decay and leave some of the decay behind. And then a third group where kids were only receiving a prevention, so diet counseling, removing plaque and fluoride treatments and sealants, but no fillings. And then they looked at how many kids in each of these groups actually went on to experience pain or infection. And surprisingly, the results are very similar for these groups. And th this had over um, 1,100 children were participating. So it's not like a small sample of 20 kids per group. These were huge national numbers. And basically 42% in that first group, the conventional treatment group had, a, had pain or infection dur during the 23 months of the study follow-up. Whereas um, it was 40% in the minimally invasive um, only group. So really sort of tells us that, you know, what we are always led to believe um, that the, you need the restoration, you need the restoration um, because otherwise you're going to get pain and infection. Um, sometimes I think there's other factors going on and maybe speaks to us as thinking about this in the context of caries risk and the lifestyle practices of the child. Um, and so we have to factor in that, you know, there are times where you may choose not to um, place a restoration um, for some children. Um, but I think the key is having good um, primary care and follow-up is, is really important. Um, that you just can't sort of say, okay, we're choosing not to do anything and just letting them go and never bringing them back for follow-up visits. And I think maybe this is also helpful for our COVID. You know, we've had, you know, eight weeks where we haven't had dental care and parts of Canada still are not back to uh, full dental services. So maybe this it should be interesting to see, you know, how many kids um, did develop problems, how many didn't. 
Um, and I think, you know, it goes to show that maybe there is some, um, um, you know, thought that we need to keep shifting this paradigm from just only a surgical approach to dealing with uh, cavities with like fillings, but we can also maybe medically manage them um, either with minimally invasive approaches, including glass ionomers or silver diamine fluoride, or just monitoring and, and other techniques. Thanks, Melina. And then often too, I think this is one that I think shocks a lot of um, dental providers is we're always trained as OUC caries, you know, since dental school, since hygiene, since dental assisting, since dental therapy, that, oh, we place that filling there, it takes the bacteria away. And, but yet it's amazing, you know, years after, a couple of years after you graduate, you start seeing patients come back and you realize, wow, I thought my fillings were perfect and these people are getting more and more caries because really um, the evidence is mounting here that placing fillings and rehabbing a kid's mouth has no measurable effect on how much bacteria they have in their mouths. So yes, we need to have kids to have access to have their mouths rehabilitated so that they can function and eat and chew, but that alone is not going to solve the problem. And so that's why we often see within six months, the risk for relapse or recurrent caries is increased. And so some of the studies here, strep mutans levels were not statistically different um, um, by just placing a filling. It was only once antibacterial therapy was also added into the routine. So whether it be more fluoride, because we know fluoride is a good antimicrobial, whether it be chlorhexidine um, or other topical antimicrobials, um, that's really when, when we start to see changes in the bacterial load and changing diet too. Um, so that's why so many people continue to get caries um, if we don't sort of stop changing behaviors and practices. Okay, thanks, Melina. Um, and then I think during the COVID time, we've had a lot of questions. I know many of us were triaging patients and we were, um, in this dilemma of is an antibiotic needed, is it not needed? So um, antibiotics aren't always needed for pain and I would say yes, absolutely. And I think a good tool is um, from a Choose Wisely Canada that they've endorsed what, um, um, there's a hospital dentistry group in Canada that have put together um, some, um, some good Q and A's for patients and dental providers to be aware of. And one of them is antibiotics are not needed when there's tooth decay or infection present, but really that it's when you have systemic signs of involvement, that's when you need it. So having the toothache uh, alone itself without signs of infection, really no need for antibiotics. And I know it's tough for us as providers because patients are used to getting their prescription, getting it filled and going home. And I think sometimes providers might be in a habit of, you know, just to keep the patient happy, they will give them a prescription for amoxicillin or penicillin, whatever it might be, even though there's no true signs of infection. And I think that number has been um, turning downturning, which is good over time. Fewer providers are doing that because we want to be careful not to contribute to this antimicrobial resistance phenomenon that's happening. But I think maybe during COVID, um, there were times probably, and I'm not going to, I'm not shaming or blaming anybody here, but I think it would be interesting to see how many dental providers actually gave prescriptions to their patients um, when they were triaging, but because of the inability to physically um, assess the patient, they went with the prescription because they just couldn't really differentiate if there was um, an infection going on that had that was starting to become systemic. And then I think my last one um, is just um, when we talk about caries risk assessment, so I know Jennifer, you had a question early on that, you know, should, should we get fluoride treatments after having a cleaning or a hygiene appointment? And I think this should come also down to risk assessment. If the child or the adults at risk for caries um, or not should then be your determining factor and there's different ways to do that. There, there is a caries risk assessment tool, but I would like to say that not just dental providers can do that. Um, and yes, for pregnant women, I think pregnant women can also get fluoride. I know there's been concerns when I gave a lecture to hygiene a few years ago 
there was some concern about um, fluoride, but think about topical fluoride. I'm talking about a fluoride varnish that has very little chance of being ingested because it is so sticky. Once it's painted on the teeth, it's not coming off. Um, I think that's good. But caries risk assessment tools, there are some that are specifically designed um, for non-dental primary health care providers. And one of them is the Canadian uh, caries risk assessment tool for kids under six years of age. And I think it's very helpful where there are no dental providers that, um, you know, I know in Manitoba, there's a lot of preschool health and wellness fairs um, that happen, not right now, but in the past few years. And sometimes if they couldn't recruit a local hygienist or a dentist or an assistant to be involved, they've actually uh, used a caries risk assessment tool to find out what, what, how risky the child is for tooth decay and then offer um, proper advice and then fluoride varnish if needed. So this caries tool was developed um, over the years and has now been published in 2019. It can be used by a whole a host of individuals um, and especially intended for use in non-dental settings. But we as dental providers, those on the call can also use this tool in their practice too. And here's just an example. It's up on the University of Manitoba website. We've got it in English, English and French and it's been pilot tested. And we're currently with uh, funding from the Network uh, for Canadian Oral Health Research and with the support of the Office of the Chief Dental Officer at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, we are um, doing a small validation exercise on this to see how predictive it truly is following a group of kids, although we've been halted a little bit in doing some of these follow-up assessments because of COVID, but look forward to maybe um, now in June, bringing some of these kids who have been delayed to get their follow-up assessments, bringing them in. So feel free, you can download those and use them. Over to you, Melina. Thank you. So since we have these um, assessment tools that non-dental providers can use, um, we also encourage anyone really to uh, promote oral health. Um, so everyone can promote, not just uh, dental providers. Um, so this year, this is a study that was um, done to evaluate the effectiveness of community workshops. Um, they were designed, um, the study was designed to equip participants with early childhood oral health knowledge and ECC prevention. Um, the, the people who participated were individuals working with infants and preschool children. And they filled out a questionnaire with um, different questions about um, oral health knowledge and um, prevention of ECC. Uh, some of the questions, for example, were um, when to take a child to the dentist for the first time, uh, questions about uh, feeding practices, that kind of stuff. And then after, uh, one month, they filled out like a follow-up questionnaire to see, we wanted to see whether um, their knowledge had improved or changed. And th the study found out that the participants' knowledge had increased after the workshop and that they, even their own like oral uh, habits had changed after learning about oral health in the workshop. So we know that um, dental professionals then are not the only ones who are able to promote oral health uh, in their communities if they have the right uh, knowledge to do so. So having these workshops in community it ca can be very useful just to you know, train other providers to provide this information to the community. So I just put here um, our website with um, all different resources that we've created. We have resources for uh, newcomers, resources um, that have been done um, for some in indigenous um, populations. We have different languages as well. Um, we have um, a lot of our resources are in, of course, English, French. We have some uh, even in Cree, uh, Jiwe, um, German, lots of different languages. And you can find them all um, on our website and you can download them, print them, or if you ever need something that cannot be printed, you can always contact us, uh, Daniela, um, and we can send stuff to you. Um, so this is our last um, topic. So Tooth Fairy Trial, we think she is. We have some uh, pictures of her actually. Um, so yeah, so we wanted to talk a little bit about different traditions around the world. Um, a lot of uh, European and North American um, 
uh, children have grown up believing in the tooth fairy. We have a picture of her there. Um, and uh, that's the most widely known tradition when it comes to um, teeth. But in Spain and a lot of Latin American countries, we have a mouse called Raton Perez, which visits uh, the children at night to take the, the teeth from under the pillow and leave some money. I grew up with this tradition and I found him terrifying myself. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, so we thought it'd be fun to share different traditions around the world. Um, in Asian countries, just um, throwing the baby teeth onto the roof, that's their tradition there. And Middle Eastern countries will just throw the teeth into the air. Um, so yeah, we thought we would end in a little fun <laughs> note here. And that is all. So yeah, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions that haven't been answered already or in the chat.